Next up, we have Alexei Soren. Um, I am very lucky to have Alexei in my lab as a PhD candidate, and he'll be talking to us about um, well, distribution dynamics of music kind of our populations along trailing the leading edges in the music students. So do you still uh, work as a pointer? Yeah, I think you're yeah, sure um, So yeah, so my name is Alex Saran, um, PhD candidate um, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a fellow at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And um, today I'm going to share uh, one part of our research which is looking at distribution dynamics of mesocarnivores, which that's all we got. In, uh, along their uh, equatorial edges and their poleward edges in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. Oh, and uh, before I get going, um, I noticed that I didn't have my co-authors on here. So Jill was in here today, Jill Kilborn. She's been with me through my master's when I was at UNH. Um, she's a co-author on this. I don't know if you know. And then uh, Tori Lynn, of course, my advisor, is a co-author on this as well. And uh, before I want to get going, I see um, people in the room who are co collaborators on this project and helped it get it going back in 2014. So I want to acknowledge all the wonderful, amazing people that have put this pro helped put this project together. And I also want to acknowledge all the um, uh, my committee members besides Tony Lynn, um, Chris Sutherland, um, Scott Mills, um, and John Lefaitis, who provided excellent tutelage over the years. So a little bit of background about the research um, kind of started um, after I finished up my <coughs> master's in uh, this, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, specifically, we're looking to had a pot of money to be able to be monitoring links, and, um, focus on links in uh, <coughs> northern New Hampshire and, and northeastern Vermont, and they were trying to uh, adapt the protocol that was created in Maine to be able to um, survey a number of different areas, including high elevation areas, and they were finding it really tough, difficult to use a snowmobile up at high elevation and survey 55 kilometers in one day. Um, so we um, got a pot of money to, uh, to, to use snow track surveys and also to be developing a camera method. So along the way we started thinking that you know, it would be really good if we could be monitoring these other um, uh, SGN species like Martin, and I was interested in monitoring Martin as well, but also fur bearers as well because they are naturally interact with, with Canada lynx. And so, um, so in both of the species that I focus on in particular with lynx and with martin are, are both considered vulnerable, vulnerable to changes in snowpack and forest composition and structure. And a lot of the work that um, Tony Lynn has done and continues to do is showing that, that high elevation habitat is predicted to be climate refugia for these species. So, and the other thing that was, especially from the Forest Service perspective and the White Mountain National Forest, is why did you know, lynx populations become extinct? or locally extinct in the end of the 1960s. There was a big boom in the 30s through the 1960s um, in the White Mountain National Forest, and they were tra actively trapping. And then it just petered out after that. And they did numerous surveys after that, and so they were wondering why they became locally extinct, or why did they colonize some of these areas like in the Nalkegan Basin, and becoming there, and they were reproducing in the early, in 2010, and then also they were gone for several years. And similarly, why did that happen in parts of like, uh, like Success, New Hampshire, where they were coming in, they were there for a couple of years, and they were gone. We're just kind of trying to get a better idea of the mechanisms for, uh, that were kind of explaining the population persistence in some areas, and then colonization, colonization and extinction in other areas. And so, some of the research questions that we put together, and I'm kind of working on myself. So what are these direct and indirect pathways that are influencing these range shifts, these shifts of range of these carnivores along their equatorial edges, like the populations like uh, of Lynx and, and Martin, but also in the, the uh, populations that are on their northern range edge, kind of leading off of what Bill was talking about, these shifts. What are the mechanisms that contribute towards these shifts? And so we use a combination of different um, uh, uh, modeling techniques and also a theoretical kind of framework to be able to evaluate this. And so we're looking at from an abiotic perspective, like how does snow influence these range shifts? And then also from like the biotic interactions, whether it be the habitat that they need, or maybe competition uh, with other species, and then getting into the snowshoe hair work, how does predation influence these dynamics? So what are the time scales for these shifts that occur? Are they occurring over uh, a season? Are they occurring every year? Are they occurring biennially? And how might these distributions change given these realized dynamics that we uncover along the way? So you might have saw a, a version of this earlier. That was the 2016 version, which was right up in here. So 
since 2014, we've been sampling um, in New Hampshire and Vermont, <coughs> covering the, uh, the latitudinal gradient of both states, and elevation gradients where we go up to you know, close to 5,000 feet. And so we're using grids, where you can't see them here, but they're two by two kilometer grids. That's our smallest unit, in, in, unit of independence. And we have 252 cameras. We're also doing snow track surveys. And snow track surveys are mostly biased towards this northern area where links were co-occurring. But we're recording um, all the species that we encounter along the way. And granted, so what I'm going to be talking about today is our camera data only. And the results that I'm um, sharing are, are just preliminary at this point. And so we also developed a method where we could go um, measure local snowpack, so we train the cameras to take pictures every day to get a daily reading of snowpack. And so we've used that to com compare that with like common uh, products that ecologists use, like Snowdas, which is an excellent product. But we also found that that was very biased, especially in high elevation areas. And those high elevation areas have, there's two like high elevation areas that are monitored for snowpack um, depths in the northeastern United States, and that's um, Mount Washington, and then that is, why am I blanking the name? Um, Mount Mansfield, exactly. So there's a combined of four out of stations in those areas. It was biased up to 40 centimeters. It was under predicting the snow depth in those areas. So that's, we're going to be using that for bias correcting the snow dust products that we, we use. Um, and so, so we're interested in, in the um, occupancy probability and the probability of currents with these, with these, uh, within this region. So, we're using single, right now I'm using single species, uh, single season occupancy models, and um, we'll be using a structural equation modeling framework to kind of get into these indirect, indirect uh, mechanisms. Um, and so our season, um, we have a de our design where we uh, don't use bait, but we use a skunk lure, and we also use a, uh, a, a turkey feather um, at our, on our snow stake. And um, we use stack season, so I'm at this point of stacking all the seasons from 2014 to 2018. <coughs> We have five years, um, and uh, so we're evaluating the top abiotic and biotic predictors of uh, detection probability and occupancy. And today I'm also going to be showing the predictive maps that are based on the top models. And these are the top abiotic variable and the top biotic variable for now. And so I'll walk you through each of the, um, the, the model results and then the figures that are associated with them. So our detection predictors, we're having snow depth temperature and week of season, these all uh, influence our ability to detect a species with using camera when it could be there, but we just didn't detect it because the snow was really, really deep and the species had a hard, the, you know, the, uh, an individual had a hard time moving through that area. Or sometimes it could be really cold and animals reduce their movements. So these are all the different predictors that we're using to figure out our detection probability. And so then our abiotic predictors, I'm going to skip through some of them because we're mostly just focusing on snow depth, snow cover, um, the length of the snow season, and snow density, of how hard the snow is. But you can also, so we're getting these values at the grid level, not the site level, but these are the home ranges. So what are the values of these in, um, um, at these different sites throughout the year, especially with regards to snow depth? There's, you could use topographic uh, ruggedness. We're not using that right now. And it's an abiotic factor. And solar radiation. And the biotic factor, so this is where we're really leaning heavily on the DSL products, and we're using um, our land cover data. We're also using a biomass later, which has turned out to be really good for being able to kind of get a serial stage or uh, an, age, an age class of the trees. So we crosswalk that with our land cover data to get like really regenerating boreal forest. And since we know this area very well, we're able to kind of, kind of ground truth it or just give it an eyeball test. And we're using those as predictors. So this, this is the biomass layer. Those in here, these are metric tons per hectare. So these are areas like Success or uh, Jericho that have been harvested quite intensively. I see some people chuckling over the last uh, uh, the last 20, 30 years. Um, so I will be include, including prey abundance as well because we get that data um, from other surveys that we're doing, but also from our camera surveys. And then competition models. But a lot of these types of biotic interactions can't be, we're not testing now, um, but we will be with the uh, structural <coughs> modeling. So, some of our results. So, here's what I'm going to do. So, the top abiotic model is always in blue. And the top biotic model, or like forest cover in this case, is always in green. And so, what I'm doing is my, for my full models, I'm combining two. I'm doing simple additive model where I'm saying, 
asking the question, what is influencing the distribution of, in this case, Martin? And so in this case, the best, the most support, these are all different hypotheses, the most support that we got for that was that it was the maximum depth of the snow, at, the, at the site, the snow site, I mean at the site, maximum depth of snow at the site, and then late regenerating boreal forest. And so we also, you know, I'm curious about how good our, our, our method is for being able to uh, estimate detection, non-detection. And so over the, um, the 30 weeks we were sampling, we reached 95% uh, confidence using our method um, in 29 weeks um, for, for American Mark. So our top models look like this. So as the snow depth increased, the probability of, of occurrence increased for American Martin to almost 100% when it got up to levels of 200 centimeters. And so you can also see it's a, 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 a strong positive relationship as well. So the more boreal forest you had within the grids, the higher, um, uh, the, higher the probability of occurrence was as well. So these are preliminary models that we're running. And so this is what this looks like in space. So these areas that are more yellow are these areas where you have a higher probability of mark occurring based on these two variables right here. And so what we will be adding as we go along is kind of the fragmentation of this forest. So this is an area where uh, deep snow or uh, late regenerating boreal forest is pretty connected. And so when you add these connectivity models or uh, connectedness models of these different variables, you're going to see these areas like this drop out. But what's interesting is that we actually did get a detection down here using this method in your southern Vermont population. It was pretty exciting. And it actually shows little pockets of, uh, of high probability of occurrence. So with Fisher, our top model was biomass. So in this case, it was, it was um, biomass and it was also the number of days of snow that occurred. So the length of your snow season, essentially. So we had really high detection probability for, for Fisher, which was great. You usually have stronger um, inference if you have higher detection probability. And so this is a wacky looking surface. Some of these are hot off the press, so some of them may look a little bit funky, but that's all right. Okay, three minutes. And uh, so they had a, a, a positive relationship, relationship with biomass and did, had a kind of a weak relationship with the number of snow days. Keep following this. So this is the Martin distribution map. This is a new thing I was experimenting with. Minus the Fisher occurrence map, because these are considered to be interacting species. So these areas that are more yellow are, have a higher probability of Martin to be of Martin occurrence, and these areas is just as likely for either of those species to occur. And these areas that are more darker blue and black are areas where you'd be more likely to find Fisher. So in lynx, it was the historical snow days. So the so the four years prior to when we started the study was one of the top bi abiotic predictors, and earlier regenerating boreal forest um, was the top one. And so you can see it gets a little wonky when it gets um, up into the higher values, but they are much more um, uh, uh, typically associated with early regenerating boreal forest, a higher probability of occurrence. And this is, doesn't explain much, but this is one of the top ones. So those areas where, um, uh, where you have more days of snow, longer snow cover, then you're more likely to have lakes. And we typically just predicted that this is where their distribution would be, higher probability. And sure enough, this is where we capture all, all of our lengths. So it's doing a pretty good job um, uh, predicting their distribution. So Bobcat, one of their competitors, you can see that historical depth, so snow depth, is also very important as well. And so is early regenerating boreal forest. So this is what they're, but it's the opposite. It's the inverse effect. And this is what their distribution was. Lower probability up here. But then the neat thing is that when you put those rasters together and you subtract them, you, you kind of see where these areas were would be much more suitable, or in this case, more likely to occur for a species like Canada lynx and less likely for a, um, for a bobcat. So we do this with red uh, fox, but I'm going to move through these remaining species and I can show you these later, because in the, in the interest of time, there's red fox occurrence. We kind of have bi had sampling bias against red fox. We were areas where there was more um, and less development, so they're also in those areas as well. And I think that their relationship together, so it uh, um, was kind of burn through these real quick. So we also are collecting on our on our prey. We have really high detection probability for all our, our prey species, which is really exciting because we're going to be using these data to be able in, in the carnivore distribution models. 
So what we did see, and Tony Lim thankfully already plugged this, was that in wintertime, the general's carnivores were typically found at lower elevation. But when the snow <coughs> melted, and during summer, we found an increase. Oh, oh, sorry. There it goes. In the summertime, we have an influx or a, a, of, of, of these generalist corners to higher elevation. So this might be kind of a good space for time substitution, what might happen in the future with a warming climate when there's less snow. And so with these latitudinal shifts happens when we had really deep snow winters. This was followed by lakes expansion. And then when we had two really shallow snow winters, this is where we had our local colonized uh, extinction events. And then again, we were able to predict a colonization event to the further to the south. The granted, there's not tons of them, but there's just a few that we were able to kind of show. So, as you can see, snow has a strong effect. Habitat also has an influence. There are lag effects, and the lag effects are only for bobcat and lynx, which is interesting. I can't remember what the method works good, but we're going to add a bunch of snow data to make it stronger. So that's what we're going to do in the future. And I already kind of integrated that into the talk as well. greater than 110 um, metric tons per hectare. So I don't even know what that looks at the ground, but in areas that I've kind of been in those, you know, where I've looked at that and I've gone to the ground, so it's typically like a second growth forest where you would be more dominated and dominated by spruce fir. Um, so you would probably have that in some sites that were maybe logged last in the 1920s through 1940s, even being a second growth forest. Yep. Yeah. 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 Ye